food wise, how do we how do we get the nutrition we need? How is how do we make it sustainable and ecologically friendly and things like that? So uh, I'm a guy. I got uh, engineering background. I've done software. Uh, I have a hobby. I was reading about this. Uh, going to PubMed, which is a big government database of all the abstracts and studies they've done. Uh, I'm not a doctor. And this is medical advice. Consult your doctor. Don't listen to me for medical advice. Uh, the thesis of this talk is that meat is the ideal human food. Um, it is the most nutritious and uh, least um, uh, negatively impactful uh, in a diet. And I'm going to uh, cover food and diet and everything, so it's content warning. So, uh, before the state, uh, the Homo genus uh, rose from monkeys and apes uh, a million or two million years ago. Um, at the time, Africa was covered in forests, and uh, the climate, climate changed, uh, the forests turned into grasslands, and uh, monkeys came out of the trees, and basically scavenged kills from predators. Uh, and, and through switching from meat, uh, or from, from plants to meat, uh, the digestive tract of monkeys you know, they, they, they're getting more nutritious food they're able to uh, get smarter brains um, we got good at throwing so from like a, this is a, a chimpanzee arm versus a human arm uh, the shoulder uh, you know we evolved to be able to throw things much quicker chimpanzees can throw like 10 20 miles an hour and throw a rock or something uh, you know humans fastball and baseball is like 90 miles an hour um, throwing rocks and sticks and javelins which obviously is good for hunting. Um, so, stomach. From what we know about the digestive system, uh, it's human pH stomach value is 1.5, which correlates with obligate scavengers, uh, vultures, hyenas, um, animals eating other dead animals. Uh, and so, uh, uh, the pH is also important for protecting against um, parasites. And, and diseases, which is important if you're eating rotting flesh versus plants. Uh, so the the exclusive tissue hypothesis from what we know about uh, metabolic rate in different animals, it's pretty consistent with animal size and the distribution of other monkeys and apes uh, the brain and gut, we expect the gut to use much more, um, to be much larger and use much more energy to digest food, which you need if you're a herbivore because you have to digest all the plant matter and convert it into things and process out the cellulose and things like that. Uh, and as a forager, uh, monkeys and apes, like they don't need a super complex brain. Um, but for what we see in humans, the brain is very large, the gut is very small. So that uh, matches up with eating a lot of kind of easy to digest, highly nutritious food like meat. Um, and the larger brain you know, is needed for planning and coordination, uh, especially with things like throwing or hunting. So this is a dig in the Ukraine. Um, each one of those bones is a mammoth jawbone. Uh, this is circa 10,000 or 15,000 BC. Um, we believe Neanderthals lived in these huts built out of all the jawbones of the mammoths they killed. So they obviously liked eating a lot of meat. Um, so, and then also all the uh, you know, cave drawings we've seen are animals um, pointing to the significance of, of meat and the diet and for nutrition. Uh, a modern civilization that we know about is the Inuit Eskimos and they don't eat any plants at all. Uh, they just hunt, you know, whale, seal, polar bears, polar bears up in the Arctic. Um, so it's obviously a sustainable diet um, from a historical perspective. And also uh, cavities, yeah. teeth are a good pointer to what is uh, the the natural diet for an animal. Um, obviously, if you're eating something and your teeth are rotting, uh, maybe that's not what you're supposed to eat um, or what you evolved to eat. Uh, and we know all, all cavities are pretty much sugar and carbs being digested by bacteria in the mouth, and the bacteria produces acid, which then corrodes the teeth. 
Um, and also in terms of effort expended, uh, it's a lot easier to hunt a single animal and then you have a large supply of meat and calories versus spending um, hours gathering uh, nuts and berries and things like that. Uh, in the historical record, there's a lot of megafauna throughout different continents, um, and they all kind of died off in around the same time period, um, between uh, 1,000 and 10,000 years ago, sometimes a little bit longer than that. And it all correlates with when, uh, in the anthropological record, humans entered that continent. Um, uh, interestingly enough, the die-off of, of large animals in Africa is lower than other continents, probably because of the uh, parallel evolution of humans on the continent with other large animals, and so they realize, hey, stay away from humans because they hunt you down. Uh, but then when we arrive in other continents, uh, they don't know that we're dangerous, and we throw sticks at them and eat them. So, uh, the current state with uh, agriculture and modern nutrition you know, in the last hundred years or so, uh, where are we at? Uh, what do we know? So, current nutrition knowledge is a very big, complex field. Um, there's things about uh, uh, issues with politics, um, science that is not accurate or has some, some um, misleading statistics and things like that. Um, epidemiology is the science of just looking at large populations and seeing what they eat. Uh, and a lot of epidemiological studies just take a survey. They're like, hey, what did you eat in the last year? Check these boxes. Um, Human memory is fallible and it's not always, <laughs> not always perfect. Uh, so a lot of those studies, it's it's hard to get good data from things like that. And then also, it's just such a broad field about like human biology, the food involved, um, hormones, what what different uh, foods do in the body, what they do on the cellular level versus uh, digestion and things. It is a big field. So here's some common wisdom. Um, which you, know, you may have heard or may have seen around, recommended by different health associations or things like that. Uh, all of these are wrong. And that's well, part of what this talk is gonna be. So, um, in terms of the basic macronutrients in, in, in your food, you've got protein, carbs, and fat. Uh, protein is structure, the body needs it every day. Um, they you know, use the protein to make cells, repair injuries, um, grow things, etc. Uh, and then carbs and fat, like the actual fuel, the energy the body uses to do things um, on a cellular level. Uh, but you don't need carbs from an evolutionary perspective. Uh, as, as we've talked about, the Eskimos don't eat any carbs. Um, you need fat for, uh, the body still uses some fat for structure, um, like cell walls and hormones and things like that. But it also uses fat primarily for fuel. Um, and then if you eat carbs, from, from a hormonal perspective, carbs raise insulin. Um, when insulin is high, it tells the body, hey, uh, don't burn fat, actually burn all of this glucose in your bloodstream instead. And then, uh, so if you eat carbs and fat at the same time, uh, your insulin goes up and it just directly, immediately stores the fat you just ate uh, in your body instead of burning it. So, you know, for, for a healthy diet where you uh, don't gain a bunch of weight, you don't want to eat carbs and fat at the same time, which is cupcakes, things like that. Uh, for the amount of protein you need, the RDA uh, recommended by the government is uh, 0.8 grams a kilogram, which is roughly like 60 to 80 grams of protein a day. Um, more, and in all the studies we've seen, more protein than that is better. Um, you're going to uh, get stronger more easily if you're working out, you're going to um, heal quicker, uh, you're going to have more energy, and there seems to be no upper limit for the amount of protein you can eat. Um, there are studies of 4.4 grams a kilogram, which is hundreds of grams of protein a day, uh, and people were totally fine um, compared to the controls. Uh, and it's kind of hard just to eat that much protein. Like, like that's. That amount of protein is like a couple pounds of lean meat, which is not super appetizing unless you get to that, uh, that volume. Uh, so, these common wisdom uh, myths. So, a uh, common tagline in like media and, and, and health and stuff is saturated fat clogs arteries, but 
uh, the arteries don't actually clog. Um, polyunsaturated fat and carbohydrates cause inflammation in the arteries, and then cholesterol comes in and tries to repair the damage, and that's what actually builds up in the arteries. But the cholesterol is just repairing the damage and not actually, uh, not actually the thing that causes the issue in the arteries. Um, statins are uh, recommended as a way to lower cholesterol, um, which would prevent heart disease and things, but since cholesterol is not actually the issue, statins are uh, not actually fixing the root cause um, and can actually have a lot of negative side effects because statin, statins uh, close off a pathway that produces cholesterol and helps your body repair things, and cholesterol is vital to all the cells in your body. Um, so, and then also, uh, that quote there, um, high ratio of triglycerides to HDL cholesterol predicts extensive coronary disease. Uh, that is the current state of the research and the best predictor of what predicts heart issues. Uh, and the correlation of high trigs, like if you eat a lot of carbs, that raises triglycerides. And uh, the largest factor that affects HDL is saturated fat. So if you eat more saturated fat and less carbs, which is like kind of a keto, low carb diet, um, that actually improves your uh, lipid lipid levels and gives you better uh, uh, better heart. Um, a lot of people say to avoid salt. Uh, this is not true. You need a lot of salt. Um, uh, low salt consumption, like it's hard to try to eat a low salt diet, but also if you eat consistently, like your body needs electrolytes, uh, you know, you sweat out the salt when you exercise. If you don't get enough salt, it doesn't have the electrolytes to move things around your cells and around your body to get fatigued easily. Um, there's a lot of negative effects. Uh, there's a book called The Salt Fix, which talks about this a lot, but basically, um, historically, there have been uh, groups um, like the Romans and, and Europeans in the past that consumed uh, tens of grams of salt a day. Yeah? Can you put me this slide? Hmm? Can I take a Yeah, this yeah. Slide? And I'll try to post these slides somewhere so people can find them afterwards. Can you, can you comment on what a, a typical diet or what a recommended diet is? Oh, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, um, the, the, the American Heart Association says that you need to consume low salt to prevent heart disease and issues. And they recommend less than 2.3 grams of salt a day. Um, and the, the uh, average American eats more than that because it's hard to eat low sodium. Um, but I think on average, uh, the, the average American eats like three to five grams a day. So, you know, even if you're eating really salty stuff like fast food, you're sort of probably gonna be under 10 grams a day. Um, unless you really like add a bunch of salt to all sorts of things. Uh, and so yeah, like, like Rome's consuming 25 grams, 18th century Europeans consumed 70 grams a day. They basically just ate salt of fish all the time um, and would heavily salt the fish to preserve it and still eat tons of salt and be fine. Um, so, and also vegetable oil is recommended, like vegetable oil is, is heart healthy, like canola oil, things like that. Um, that's not actually true. Uh, when you break down the types of fatty acids, you have saturated, um, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated, which uh, describe the structure of the fatty acid. Um, saturated has no double bonds, it's a straight chain. Uh, when monounsaturated has one double bond, and polyunsaturated has two or more double bonds, uh, the double bonds are the easiest point in the fatty acid to react with. Um, so it's easy to oxidize, right? Um, uh, polyunsaturated, if you have two or more double bonds, it's easy for something to come in that'll oxidize it like glucose uh, or, or other things. Um, so, and also uh, polyunsaturated includes all of, like if you've heard of omega-3s and omega-6s, uh, those are two different kinds of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and the, you know, the common, the research says omega-3 is anti-inflammatory, you know, it's like in fish oil and things like that. Um, and omega-6 causes inflammation and is not good uh, in your body. And the most common omega-6 is uh, linoleic acid. Um, so there's, there's some papers that talk about the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the diet. And uh, historically, a ratio of one to one is, 
this seem to, seems to be the healthiest because you know, you're low on the omega-6, which causes inflammation. Um, but in a modern uh, American diet, we have a lot of omega-6 based on how we uh, grow our food and um, produce our food and process our food. Uh, omega-6 is most common in vegetable oils um, because we take all of the seeds and process them down put them through um, industrial solvents and you end up with a bunch of polyunsaturated fat which is uh, liquid at room temperature which is really good for cooking um, but also causes a lot of issues when you cook it and eat it it's easily oxidized and becomes a bunch of negative things you don't want um, so some, some commonly researched uh, oxidation products of linoleic acid are acroline and then H&E and MDA, which don't do anything good at all uh, in your body and you don't want them at all. Uh, but also vegetable oils are very, a very modern invention. Um, in 1911, uh, cotton gins had a lot of industrial waste, right? Uh, so the cotton gins would process the cotton out of the cotton seeds and they had all these cotton seeds they couldn't do anything with. Um, Proctor and Graham, uh, Proctor and Gamble figured out how to take cotton seed, uh, cotton seeds and turn it into cotton seed oil, which then they could hydrogenate and turn into a food product known as uh, Crisco. Um, and so that's the start of vegetable oil, uh, which was a net win for Proctor and Gamble because they added industrial waste that they can now sell as food, um, but it's not good for eating. <laughs> Uh, it's not digestible, isn't it? Cottonseed oil is not. When, when, when they processed it into a hydrogenated polyunsaturated fat, um, it's edible. You, you can eat it. It's not nutritious or good for you. Uh, but it tastes kind of like butter, so you can sell it. Um, and, and linoleic acid is the most common omega-6 and is the most common in seed oils. Um, and in animals, uh, it, is, it is necessary in all of our animal experiences, uh, experiments with cancer, you need linoleic acid in the diet to uh, actually give the animal cancer. Um, it causes the inflammation in arteries to drive coronary heart disease and generally contributes to inflammation and obesity in the body. Um, and there's also been some papers about omega-6 being the cause of all the modern diseases of civilization. So things like heart disease, um, obesity, um, cancer, everything like that, uh, that has like massively risen in the last uh, couple decades. So here's a nice chart uh, comparing the different kinds of fats and different things uh, found in the diet. Um, red is saturated fat, blue is monounsaturated, green is polyunsaturated. So as you can see like oils, like canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, are very high in polyunsaturated fat because they're seed oils. Um, olive oil and also uh, coconut oil are very uh, low in polyunsaturated fat, so they're one of, you know, because they're more of a, uh, an oily plant um, and you're not actually like processing all of the seed shells to try to extract the fat from that. Um, dairy products and meats are low in polyunsaturated fats. Um, nuts vary based on what nut they are. Um, and also butter. Again, because it's an animal source, is very low in polyunsaturated fats. Um, another myth is that snacks keep your metabolism up. You know, snack, you eat six times a day, keep your metabolism up. Uh, that's not actually true, and you know, correlates uh, evolutionarily with um, hunting. You know, if, if we ate a big meal and then it'd be a while before we got another big meal, uh, we kind of evolved to eat that way. When um, historically this chart here shows the eating frequency over time, uh, different different time periods. In in the past, uh, like in the 70s, we were eating on average two, maybe three meals a day. Now in the 2000s, we're uh, on average eating five, six meals a day, and that has not helped uh, nutrition in general. Uh, another idea is that grains are heart healthy. You see this on all sorts of packaging and boxes. It's got whole grains. Eat your whole grains for the day. Um, it'll improve uh, your, your heart. Um, grains are not good for you in general. Uh, gluten is, is pretty problematic in the gut, um, in the body. 
so this is a, a little diagram of the intestines. You've got these cells here. Um, gluten ends up, uh, uh, these cells are like the lining of your, of your intestine, and that's how your body absorbs nutrients from the food. Um, and gluten will widen the uh, tight, there's things called tight junctions between the cells, which means the cells are very close together. Gluten will just open that up like a vice, and then pretty much anything can go through there, um, including the things your body doesn't want to absorb, uh, which is not good and seems to uh, have a lot of correlations with different diseases in the literature. Uh, and also, besides just gluten, um, grains are just carbs, and again, like carbs combined with uh, vegetable oil cause inflammation coming back to uh, inflammation in your arteries. Um, and also, uh, gluten has been seen to degrade into morphine-like substances uh, known as exorphins. And then, uh, along with gluten opening the tight junctions, you have a minor drug-like effect of wheat, which makes it a little bit addictive. Um, again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, carbs are not an essential nutrient. Um, you can eat you can eat diets without them, just like the Eskimos did. And uh, people will say that the the brain needs carbs, and I think like one other organ needs a little bit of carbs. But uh, your body can produce glucose from protein and other things uh, if it needs to, and then it just produces the exact amount it needs and doesn't get an excessive amount that would cause inflammation. Um, fiber, people talk about fiber uh, as, as preventing constipation and being good for your gut, but uh, there's no actual study saying adding fiber to a diet uh, has positive effects. Um, the few studies we have that say uh, fiber seems to be beneficial is because fiber, when you eat fiber, you're pushing something else out of your diet. So uh, if you're eating fiber, you're eating um, like bread or fruit or vegetables, uh, and if you're pushing out uh, like straight sugar and other junk food, it is going to have a positive effect from, from removing the more deleterious foods. Um, vegetables. Vegetables uh, uh, seem to be, you know, people say like, hey, you need, you need a balanced diet, you need vegetables, you need everything in moderation. Um, Animals are able to run away from you, like uh, from, a, from a perspective of us hunting animals. Um, vegetables don't have any defenses. Uh, they don't have any claws, they can't run away, so they have their own defenses, which is different uh, poisons and other uh, chemicals to prevent you from eating them, um, which is very effective against insects and small animals, but uh, not as effective against us because we're large and take a lot more to kill. Uh, but these things will still cause um, effects over a long enough time period, which you probably don't want uh, to happen in your body. Um, people talk about pesticides on crops. Uh, pesticides on crops, yes, we use them to, to grow crops better and not get the crops eaten. But uh, from a research perspective, uh, the pesticides in plants, that plants use as defenses, um, seem to be just as bad, if not worse, than the pesticides we use in terms of the volume of what you eat. Uh, the pesticides in plants are going to be much more common than whatever residue is left over on the plant when you, when you buy it from the grocery store. So, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the new nutrition of eating just meat and any questions people have about that. Uh, so, there... Uh, all meat diets are kind of a, a recent um, research interest by people um, and sort of like a, a new idea versus uh, an extension of like low carb and keto diets which you know, cut out grains and things like that but you still have vegetables involved. Um, there's a website of a lot of people doing diets like these and um, posting their stories and, and anecdotes and uh, eating all meat without plants seems to affect a lot of different things, um, which a lot of people have said they receive benefit from. So uh, it's an interesting uh, field, and there needs to be more research done on it to see what the actual effects are here. Um, so meat has protein and fat, um, sodium, potassium, magnesium, vitamins A, vitamin B, uh, all those vitamins. Um, 
easily, easily readily available and absorbable. Uh, when you eat only meat and no carbs, some of the RDAs change um, based on what we've seen uh, in research. So carbs will deplete some electrolytes faster, um, like potassium and magnesium, but if you don't eat carbs, you don't need to eat as much um, magnesium and, and potassium. Your body holds on to those electrolytes better. Uh, vitamin C, people talk about you need uh, citrus fruits, you need vitamin C to prevent scurvy. Um, you only need a trace amount of vitamin C if you're not eating carbohydrates um, because glucose and vitamin C actually compete for the same receptors in the body. Uh, and in, in uh, the USDA database, meat shows up as having no vitamin C, but that's just because uh, when they did the original research and testing, they were like, we know there's a small or no vitamin C in this meat and we're just not going to actually test for it and just wrote zero in the field. Um, and vitamin E is in plants, but also in some animal foods. Um, and it's just an antioxidant that your body will use. But also, uh, if you don't eat a lot of carbs, uh, your body has natural antioxidants like glucathione and uh, urea that it uses to handle all the uh, antioxidant needs in the body. Um, again, fiber is unnecessary. Uh, vitamin K, um, there's two different forms of K. K1 is in plants, K2 is in animals. Um, hard cheeses are the highest source of K2. Uh, and vitamin D, go outside. Sunshine is really good. Uh, not just for vitamin D, but all the other benefits. Um, mitochondria are the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, uh, so, so uh, also a lot of recent literature on modern diseases in terms of things like um, Alzheimer's and, and other uh, brain diseases and things like that uh, come back to energy production in, on the cellular level. Um, and so, you, uh, uh, deterioration of mitochondria and the mitochondria's ability to produce energy consistently um, seems to be correlated with all these diseases. Um, from, from a molecular perspective, from a cell metabolism perspective, uh, the, the most recent research in, in, the, in the last couple of decades points at um, long chain saturated fat is the uh, best source of energy for mitochondria. Um, it stimulates the generation of new mitochondria, and it tells it to not keep stocking up on energy. Uh, if, you, if you feed glucose or unsaturated fats with mitochondria, mitochondria will just kind of like grab everything it can, um, kind of store up energy, and also uh, will kind of let the uh, complexes, the mitochondrial complexes in the cell kind of deteriorate and, and fall apart and not be as efficient in producing energy as they could be. So, um, the future of food. Uh, where do we go from here? How do we, how do we, like meat is obviously, everybody eating all meat all the time is not sustainable uh, or ecologically friendly. So how do we get there, um, ideally? So there's some current uh, uh, new fake meats, um, things like the Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger, uh, that are, you know, try to imitate meat as close as possible and not just be like a, a black bean burger patty or something like that that's similar. Um, the ingredients of both the Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger are mainly, uh, mainly consists of vegetable oils um, and different plant proteins, uh, which as I established earlier, vegetable oils are not that good for you. Um, and plant proteins are, are good, you know, it's the basic proteins, but they're uh, slightly different amino acid ratios and not quite as absorbable as animal protein. But uh, these are good approximations. There's definitely lots of room for improvement, um, but they are nutritionally different than meat. Um, so algae as like a source of, of nutrition, um, there's a lot of research in this and there's a lot of possibility for improvement. Um, you can, you can just currently now you can just buy algae protein and al algae oils uh, for food, for consumption. Um, but again, like the amino acid ratios are different in the protein, and the oils have slightly different ratios, again, of like the polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, saturated. Uh, so here's an example of some algae you can just buy for food. Um, the amino acid ratios are a little unbalanced. As you can see, there's a lot of arginine and uh, glutamate. Um, 
which is not the best, but it works for protein. Um, and you know, over time, we could genetically engineer this to produce a, a more balanced amino acid profile. Uh, Lab-grown meat is also a possibility. Um, a big question about lab-grown meat is, can we actually make it the same as uh, meat from uh, classic uh, farms and, and, and animal production? Um, the, the thing with lab-grown meat is we're feeding it all of the nutrients and energy that we want to feed it, and it may not be the exact same um, ratios and, and kinds of nutrients that a cow would get from eating grass. Um, and so, you know, based on some of the uh, political issues and um, discussions around saturated fat and things like that, uh, there have been attempts at producing uh, lab-grown meat that is healthier and has like less saturated fat, um, which could be you know a, a net loss uh, if it's less healthy than uh, meat would be. Um, so another question is. Am I, am I over? What? Oh, that's uh, so you know, there's a lot of desert. You can, you can you can convert. So so if you if you if you manage cattle properly, you can actually use cattle to turn um, uh, scrubland and, and and desert kind of back from uh, uh, a deteriorated area into grassland. Um, so I'm, here's a bunch of examples. Uh, all this grass here is on land that was uh, holistically managed um, with cattle, and before it looked just like the dirt on the uh, right. Um, here's another before and after example of properly uh, grazed and managed cattle. Um, another, uh, also land use uh, is an issue for the future of the human population in terms of growing food, and probably, probably, <laughs> And probably, you know, uh, growing crops and, and, and things in space is a good use because you have all of the uh, easily accessible energy of sunlight. It's not going through an atmosphere. You've got all the space you possibly need, and you can take the food wherever you need to take it. Uh, what about the environmental damage that we already have from the large areas of cattle and agriculture in this way already? Can it increase, you want to increase this? Yeah, so, so there is, um, like, like for example, uh, the recent things with uh, Brazil. Um, in Brazil, like cutting down parts of the rainforest uh, for, for more beef and cattle production. Um, what Brazil is actually doing is they're cutting down uh, trees to grow soy and then feed the soy to cattle. So um, uh, from an from, from, uh, ecologically friendly perspective, the ideal way to have cattle is to graze them on grass. Um, and then uh, instead of feeding them things like corn and soy and wheat that we uh, monocrop elsewhere where we till up the land and destroy the environment and then feed that to cattle, um, it's more effort to, to properly manage them and raise them on grasslands. Um, but, yeah. 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 Um, and so there, there, you know, it comes back to like different industrial incentives. We like massively subsidize wheat and corn um, from a civilizational perspective, that's good because you have a, a food that you can easily dry and store um, and can get easy calories to people versus meat, um, which is much harder to, to store and maintain. But uh, ideally, you would grow, uh, you would raise cattle on grass. So, I don't know how this goes right now to talk about to you about later if you're okay with that yeah. um, but I would like to point out that what I do not speak for people but though it is not really considered a slur there is a very touchy history with the word Eskimo and okay. it refers to like a bunch of different groups and there is not really like one word to refer to all of the um, Arctic Native peoples but it's indigenous peoples but it's still like okay yeah, yeah I can, I can, I'll talk to you later about that yeah. you figure that out um, that's basically, I think, the end of this presentation. So, yeah. Do you, uh, have you heard about the uh, captured carbon grown protein? Uh, I have not, actually. I, I guess it was some NASA experiment that a company is taking on where they actually uh, 
capture atmosphere of CO2 and 